So everybody's, uh, all the council, whoever is invited, they can come, but obviously people have uh, other commitments and things like that, so there's no uh, rhyme or reason as to who's here and who's not, but I know uh, uh, Phil Curran is here, a member of our common council. Mary Teichelt's here, she's also a member of our common council, and we thank them for, for coming out tonight. Mike McLaughlin, who uh, is the chief of staff uh, to my office, and Ted Kasumpis, who uh, works to uh, liaison the, the complaints. So typically when you call my office, at some point you get a hold of Ted. Uh, if you're not using the 311 line, and then we go ahead and uh, try to solve your problem. Um, so uh, we want to thank them again for being here and appreciate their time. Uh, generally what we're trying to do is just give you a sense of overview of some of the things, uh, issues that we're working on, and then we just throw it open to questions. People have questions, comments, concerns, criticism, we take it all. Uh, don't necessarily have all the answers tonight, but we try to track down an answer for you eventually um, and, and go from there. Uh, so what's happening? Well, we just finished uh, completing our budget. Uh, that was done in May. Our capital budget was completed in June. Um, and so the uh, projects that are in there are um, going uh, onward and they're moving forward. I have to tell you, I'm obviously very concerned about the economy. Uh, I think we all are, I mean, gas, energy, all the things that are happening. And so we've been uh, very careful on the city side uh, to monitoring our spending. One of the things we did as effective April 15th is we put a spending freeze on, we put a hiring freeze on. Uh, we also have an internal business audit committee that's going through all 33 departments, meeting with the department heads, looking at uh, how they budget, what they use their dollars for, is there any chance for savings, combining resources. Uh, we set a goal of eliminating about 10% of the workforce, uh, both citywide. Uh, we've already eliminated approximately six positions, I think it's four or five, maybe six, on the city side through attrition. We're not laying anybody off, but when people retire, we try to reorganize and, and d d divvy up those duties amongst other people. And the school also, school system also, I think the Reading Leaders, which was a program that we had uh, funded by the state, the state didn't fund it, uh, so they took those uh, teachers and then uh, backfilled the retirements, um, although I still think there's four or five teachers that are, that have not been placed yet, there's about, uh, the net is a saving about 20, 25 positions on, on, the, on the school side. The number one expenditure we have, no question about it, is staff and personnel. And, and this organization, aside from energy, it's benefits, insurance, health care, uh, salaries, benefits, all that stuff. Uh, that really drives a lot of the budget. So the, the more we can combine, the more we can become more efficient, uh, the more money we'll save doing that. Uh, and so we're also looking at some little things that have always been pet peeves of mine, but uh, we're working on them. One is use of city vehicles. Who needs them? Why are they signed a vehicle? Uh, is there a way we can do it with a pool? We did set up a pool several years ago where people sign out a vehicle. Uh, and so we're, we're looking to make sure that uh, the people that have a vehicle signed to them are, are actually need the vehicle and are using it for its intended purposes. The other thing, believe it or not, is cell phones. We get what I call cell phone creep. It means that one person gets a cell phone in the department and then the next person can't talk to that person on the direct connect Nextel without their own, I think it's Sprint now, right? Without their own Sprint Nextel phone. So now they've got to go get one so they can talk together. And pretty soon the whole department, they all have cell phones. Well, all those add up. They cost money to our plan. Uh, and they also use the data feature. They use the text messaging. And that also costs money, and oftentimes they're over their limits and over their minutes. So we're looking at reapportioning how people use those phones, making sure they're paying personally for their personal calls, uh, and that kind of stuff. So uh, those things we're looking at as well. Big picture-wise, we've been talking to the Board of Ed about uh, looking at combining some services over the long term. For example, we ought to have a unified purchasing structure where we do all the purchasing uh, through one office, all the bidding's done through one office. Again, try to maximize uh, our return. For example, if the city's buying paper and the school system's buying paper, it's kind of silly to have two bids for paper out there. We ought to put one big bid. Again, you're not going to save a million dollars, but you know, 10,000 here, 20,000 here, it as soon starts to add up into significant savings. Uh, same thing with information technology. Uh, for years, I've been asking the board to combine two IT departments. It's silly to have the city buying one kind of computer. Festival. Maybe you had to go there. It was kind of cool. Palace was open. It's really neat to see that facility open again. 
and uh, we're having the Nutmeg Games, which will be July 26th through August 3rd. That has about uh, 4 to 5,000 athletes participating. They bring their parents, so there's going to be activities all up and down Main Street on our fields, uh, and it, they have an Olympic-style uh, game. We actually have a, a grand opening at uh, Denver High School Field uh, where they come in. I'm going to bring the torch for the last half mile if I don't die, uh, running that in. If anybody knows CPR, if you could be handy, that would be appreciated. Uh, and then we, we light a torch in the whole bed, so it's kind of neat, and um, if you're on time, you might want to check out some of the events uh, and things like that. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, and so that, that should be a big event for the city. We're also working on developing the city economically. We continue to be in long-term discussions with several major corporations. I can't tell you who they are. I can tell you those things are looking rather positive, but that could change tomorrow, just the way that the nature of those, the culture of those groups work. But I'm uh, feeling pretty optimistic about our ability to recruit business and retain business within the city. So we're kind of excited about that. We're having a great year crime, knock on wood. I say that tomorrow we have a major event, but in general, in spite of the high profile things you see, statistically speaking, we're doing very well. Um, and uh, we routinely have one of the lowest crime rates, if not the lowest crime rate in the state. Our unemployment rate still is outpacing uh, the rest of the state in terms of being low. So economically, we're doing well locally, but the national uh, situation is causing a lot of stress on everybody. So that, those are all good signs for us here locally. Housing prices. Uh, last quarter of, uh, first quarter of, of 08, we just finished an analysis. I know you're not going to believe this, but it's true. In Danbury, single family homes rose 3%. The price of them went up, actually went up. Now you hear about prices dropping and collapsing. We're not seeing that here in Danbury. That may be true in California, Florida, Nevada, Arizona, all those other places, and it is true, it's happening. But locally, we haven't seen that happen yet. We do see a, re a, a slight reduction in condominiums. Uh, and in apartments, uh, multi, you know, four or five apartments, uh, a home like that. But in general, single family homes have, have pretty much held their value, which is a good thing long run. It's a bad thing short run, good thing long run. Okay, I know. Uh, and so um, that's pretty much the state of the city, the state of the economy in about five seconds. So with that, we have questions and concerns. I need to come out here in the rain. To, uh, maybe you did, but uh, um, what do you have? Uh, anybody want to throw something for discussion in general? Anybody have a particular issue? Let you're always good at bringing something. <laughs> sit down, sit down. After the rainstorm uh, years ago, from what I understand, that area down on Main Street near the beautiful park that you put in, um, park? Yeah, yeah. it was kind of under almost three feet of water. Um, and cars were driving over some of the grass to try not to get stuck in the heavy duty water. Where a year ago, I believe, you started the drainage plan where this has Yeah, um, well, you know, we are uh, plugging away at the drainage plan. Uh, I don't know the exact status of that. I have to talk to Antonio. Um, and when we get two or three inches, in that case, it's about two inches of rain, an hour and a half to two hours, the city has a hard time handling that kind of deluge. It's just difficult to be able to manage that. And, and drainage is an issue not just in that area. It's an issue throughout the city. We've done a lot of good work throughout the city in hitting a lot of the high-profile areas. That area is really connected to, as Lynn knows the history here, the, the East Ditch. Uh, I have a speech from the mayor of Danbury in 1889 who spoke about fixing the drainage problem at the East Ditch. Um, we have made some progress over the years, not as much as we want. It's a big ticket item. It's, it's several million dollars to correct if not more. So we've been trying to break into phases. Do a little phase here, clean that out, do the next phase on a bigger pipe. I'm not sure where they are, but I'll check for you. I hate to see that beautiful part. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And why do people try to drive through the water when it's like four feet high? I, 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 they, they, you know, it's a problem. So, good. Um, but we're, we're working on it. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the security of the schools. Yep. And what's going to be done about it? And what action plans are in place? Are um, going to be in place? The question was, what's, what, you know, what's the status of security of the schools? What's the action plan? Uh, what are we doing about it? There's a number of things we're doing. One, and, and really, let me just kind of take a step back and say one of the issues we had uh, was here at King Street, as it related to, um, and we, we have a pretty good beat on who we think know, we think we know who did it, and they were somebody that had access to the building. So whatever security plan we had in place wouldn't have mattered because they had access to the building. So um, that's one thing to understand that. But there is a larger, a, a larger question about. Uh, are we secure? And uh, one of the things that we are doing is we're installing cameras 
uh, throughout the city. We're also uh, putting in the swipe card system for the staff where you, you hit the, the little swipe thing, pops the door and you go in uh, to try to restrict some of the access uh, to the building. Uh, the high school's already got their cameras installed. They have to order some servers and some equipment. They're doing that now. Uh, the cafeteria, for example, and I have to tell you, um, the incident with the, uh, uh, with the bomb was you know, terrifying for everybody. It was horrible. Um, but what I really worry about is, you know, God forbid some kind of incident at the high school. Uh, not a bombing, well, maybe with a bomb, I don't know. But the point is we got a lot of kids there in one area. Uh, so, for example, um, a camera isn't going to stop them, but it's going to help us recreate what happened uh, leading up to that. We also mounted cameras on the outside of the building as well to be able to know who's coming in, coming out, particularly around the exits and entrance. Each building is reviewing their own security plans, whether it be a lockdown plan, if there's a, something going active problem in the building, be it an employee or, or, or with a child. Um, in addition to that, um, we're also looking at uh, wiring up all the elementary. All the elementary schools will be wired. In fact, this building, you know, we already, we're doing that. We're gonna accelerate that now, hopefully finish all of that this summer for the opening of school. Well, a suggestion also would be to have drills. I mean, and have the children drill. I'm a teacher in another state, and our kids actively drill lockdowns, emergency right. evacuations, and the kids, from my understanding, have no clue of what to do in the situation. Yeah. I can't speak what school that is. I can tell you the high school, I know drills. We drill three or four times a year. In fact, we just had one last week, and we had one in the fall. Uh, we do two kinds of drills. We do the lockdown drill. There's a, a special a code that goes through the speaker system. I know what it is, I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Teachers know it to, to keep their kids in the room. It's sort of a routine message that, that teachers will listen for. They drill that a lot. Uh, and then there's the evacuation drill uh, for you know, fire or that kind of incident. Um, in the case of the, um, uh, the bomb threats, uh, what it showed is that um, we did a, a really good job of moving the high school kids around. Now it's not perfect. Parents aren't gonna be able to pick up their kid at the front gate and have us load them in because our number one focus is the child. It's not the parent. You're safe. You're in your car outside on Beckley Street. No offense, but we care about the child in the building. I had somebody call me up and was yelling because they're, they, we wouldn't let the child go from East Bay Gate through the school because they were parked on Beckley and they didn't want to drive all the way up around. I mean, she was screaming at me. And I go, look, I, I don't care about your problem. I care about your child, and I'm not going to let your daughter walk through the building while we're looking for a bomb. I'm just not going to do it. So. Um, uh, in that case, you know, the high school worked flawlessly. If there are other buildings that haven't drilled, then um, that's something that the superintendent is going to uh, certainly, I'm, I'm sure, going to, you know, impress upon them the importance of that. We are going to meet with all the principals two days before school opening in the fall to emphasize the importance of the fire drills and, and uh, making sure that they're, that they're cognizant of what the evacuation plan is and that they actually practice it once in a while. Now, our fire marshal does go to every building. Well, I'm not talking about just fire, though. I'm yeah. actually talking about a bond scare, going to a separate location, right. and having an early dismissal where the parents, the kids practice it, especially right. kindergarten through fifth grade. Yeah. It, it, you know, that's something we can just, that's something we can just, one of the things that we, we did discuss during the debrief about all that issue was that um, uh, parochial schools, we had to keep them better in the loop. Uh, we had to make phone calls to all the principals individually and explain what was going on. They were great, super cooperative, but um, they hadn't designated an emergency person in the room that the city can talk to when there's a broad system-wide issue. Um, in terms, and so, and, that, and so the communication amongst, the, amongst those folks has to be improved on and we're working on that. But I'm gonna tell you, you know, we moved about 10,000 kids in about, I don't know, two hours, hour and a half or so. A pretty good job, all things considered. All things considered. There are things that can always be improved on. Uh, War Memorial was one of those uh, things that we can improve on. But I went down there 4.15 or so, nobody was left. It was maybe, a new, right, Michael, when you're down there, that late, it was 4.15 or so, and there was not there. But look, we can always get better at it. It's, it's something that we're always going to, you know, have to be vigilant about. Unfortunately, today's going to change. Yes, ma'am. I think that the evacuation went very well. Um, my kids go to this school, but my question is, we were told by the Board of Education that King Street Intermediate, because of the way we were set up, was first on the list to have the cameras and the buzzing system installed and that it was going to be complete by the time we got back from Christmas vacation. And it wasn't. And we were told by the assistant superintendent, superintendents that the reason was some type of incompatibility with the Honeywell system. Why one has anything to do with the other, I'm not sure. But how did the compatibility issue get solved within four days of the bomb threat? 
And why do we not have the cameras installed in the beginning of the year yeah. as we were promised? I, I don't know. You know, I'd have to check with the Board of Ed about that. I haven't heard about a compatibility issue. We've been well, there obviously isn't one. It couldn't have been solved in, you know, 72 hours. Well, they might have solved it in the four months since Christmas, though. I mean, we, we were always moving forward to putting these cameras in. That much I know because I inquired about them because we funded them. Um, and so as far as there was a compatibility issue, I'd, got, I'd have to check on that. I don't know, and I'm going to guess that they probably re have resolved it. I don't think they did it in four days. I think they've been working on it for months. Again, in this case, without telling you too much, um, I don't think cameras would have solved this issue, unfortunately. Now, that doesn't mean it won't help in another system, even for vandalism, which is a perennial problem in some of our buildings. Cameras definitely help in that question. And for peace of mind. Yes, ma'am. That's not me, by the way. When you get the Honeywell call, that's not the city's call out no, system. I know. I'm just venting. Okay. Because no, just so you know. The yeah. reason I'm venting is because I emailed the PTO and asked for a PTO meeting in June, and I was told that it wasn't any of the PTO's business and from the new president. And then the principal from KSP called me, and she told me the same thing. You know, don't worry, we're handling it. And they sent home a very curt letter saying, yes, this was found. Everything is handled well. We will investigate it. Security systems will be in the 10 days, which they were. And this principal never called me, never called me back. They never had a PTO meeting. There was no forum for parents to get any information. All the information I got on that was from the newspaper. Yeah. Like, I had no idea that it was from an employee. Well, I would. Please don't repeat that. We, we don't, I'm not saying that's the case. It was from an employee. Speculation. A lot speculation. of speculation. Yes. Please. Well, I had no idea that. I didn't know. Kids went back to school the next day. And there was no other mention of it, not even in the newspaper. So here I'm sitting here, and I'm like, I know they found something. The last I read the papers, they sent it out for an evaluation right. to see what it exactly was. Never heard what it was. Right. And things just continued on. And, and I'm hearing that kids were told, especially in this school, because they're old enough to question what happened. And I know my son knew what happened. And nobody ever discussed it here. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't give them any more information than what you could read in the newspaper. Yeah. I, just, I, I just felt like the parent community of King Street it's kind of just brushed, yeah, yes. brushed off. And, and actually heard. now, I'm going to just chime in. To hear please, that it please. could potentially be an inside job as a parent is even more frightening yeah. Yeah. for other people. Well, but, but, but I mean, these are the people that are looking at the board of education. Yes. Yeah, well, what, let, let me just, let, one at a time. One at a time. Let me just take a step back. Look, it, 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 it has nothing to do with any current employee, OK? So just so, so I just want to be clear about that, OK? Um, there are a lot of different suspects in this particular case. We don't think at this point that the two issues were related, but we're not sure. I mean, there's still a lot of things that we're working on. The robbery and, and the bank robbery and, the, and this issue here. But, so, so getting back to that, um, and your point was that, look, you know, the principal here, superintendent, board of ed, get, have to communicate better with you, even if it's a debrief yes. a couple of weeks after to say, hey, look. Yeah. That's a good point. I, and, and you know, we can, I can talk to the superintendent and we can maybe prior to going back in in the fall have some kind of meeting like that. We definitely, uh, I'll definitely talk to him and kind That's of brief everybody where we're right right. What's that? That's the reason many of us are here right now. Yeah, no. There's parents here right now that don't even have children in the school yet, but they're very concerned about sending them yeah. and what goes on here. Right. Well, I think communication is key. I'm going to tell you that. Um, Unfortunately, you know, it, I'm not going to suggest that this isn't a serious incident. It is. Fortunately for us, everything worked pretty well. Uh, but we're very proud of our schools. Our schools are very safe. This is one of this is a great school. And uh, um, if we need to communicate, I'm going to relay that to the superintendent and have him talk to the principal. And I'm going to ask that they have some kind of pre-opening meeting just with the parents, talk a little bit about safety and security up here and about some of the steps we've taken over the summer. I think that's uh, a good way to start the new school year. No question about that. On the same lines, and, and talk about communication and drills and that sort of thing and what the plans are, part of the issue I had, and I thought this exactly to be handled very well, my son's at KSP, and, and he, I couldn't have asked for it to be handled any better on his end. On my end, it was very confusing to get a call saying, go to the firehouse, but if the bus has already come, then you're going to have to go and meet the bus. And then if you miss the bus, you're going to go someplace else, where it seems that if there were these plans in place, which the principal has said to there were. As parents, if we had known what the plans were, 
we could have been better able to cope with it instead of getting an emergency phone call, yeah. rushing, not knowing quite where to go, trying to hear on the radio, the newspaper, and I'm sure calling your office, the school board of education, and everybody else. Why as parents are we not left in the loop as to what yeah. the emergency plans are, where our children are going to be sent if A, B, and C happens, so that we as families can plan for that as well? I think those points are, are well taken, and I think, uh, again, I'm going to share them with the superintendent and say, look, uh, let's share those plans with the parents. Let them know what happens in, in, in case the worst happens. We don't want that to happen. Probably will never happen, but we want to be prepared. Um, I think one of the things, too, is that um, we were definitely, things were very fluid that day. They are moving very quickly. And again, I just want to emphasize that, that as mayor of the city, my responsibility is for your child. And, and I know it's unnerving to not know where your kid is. But I, it does create a safety issue for the children right. when, like I said, I'm right. table pick with how the evacuation I, I got you. But trying to get to King Street Firehouse, yeah. if we had all known in advance that that's where it was going to go, yeah. so the buses didn't necessarily have to be there, or we knew if we didn't go there that we could go directly to the bus stop, maybe there wouldn't have had to be 150,000 parents trying to get to the yeah. kids all at one time. And that's really where I think the communication could help out. Good. And I'll make sure that happens before the, the start of next school year. We got to let everybody have a nice summer first. We'll get back to that. Yes. At the risk of you know, belaboring this point, I have a question because um, I know that uh, you know there were certain issues with the communication of the parents and the Honeywell school system. Um, but I know that there's also I don't know if there are separate systems, but we often get the messages from yourself. You know your, your recorded message about snow removal when there's right. Right. that kind of thing. Are those not are, are those those same type of messages? Are they not available in a larger scope? Say it wasn't a, a school issue. I think I think another issue was when um, they had the <coughs> issue on Patton Arrow Road. Yep. Like, the but was there, is there a particular reason that couldn't have been utilized? Though? Well, we we did uh, we did utilize it in a very limited scope right around the building to evacuate people. Okay. There's there's two systems. Just to, I don't want to bore you with the detail, but I'll kind of give you the, the big picture. There's two systems that operate. The board of that operates the Honeywell system that everybody hears about. That's designed to call you in the morning and say no school snowing. Um, I don't know how much else they use it for. If they use it to, to parent teacher announcements anything like that, but um, that's that's the system that the board of ed purchased several years ago. We have. A different system. Our system is based on emergency management. So my database, not mine, the city's database, has every phone number in the city, including unlisted numbers. And we don't have cells, but people do email in, and we, you know, we add them in as we go along. So that system is used to evacuate a lost child, a snowstorm coming, God forbid some other kind of calamity that's going to happen. We use it for that, and then we also use it for community um, uh, information. Uh, you know, the, the taste of Danbury is this week and the hours are, that kind of stuff. We try not to beat it to death. I try not to call you 500 times a, a week because it's obnoxious, I know that. So we try to make a judgment call about what's, what information do you need out there, leaf pick up, stuff like that. Um, the Honeywell system, from what everybody tells me, from the, from the parents I've talked to, there were cutoffs, dropped kind of messages, it got about halfway through and then it would uh, not complete the message. It doesn't reboot, so if you pick it up halfway through, it doesn't start from the beginning and go through there again. Um, I'm sure, and I've talked to Dr. Pascarella, I'm sure they're working on correcting some of those technical issues. Our system, I really haven't had too many of those complaints because um, it's a little more sophisticated, and I've even asked Dr. Sal if he wants to migrate over to our system. It seems like it's a, it's a better system, frankly. It gets the messages out quick. It can do 40,000 phone calls in about five minutes. And, um, and I, you get an actual, I get a printout, so I know, for example, we called around here to evacuate uh, because of this issue. I knew who we talked to in the house. Did they pick it up live? How long were they on the phone for? And, uh, or did we drop it on the answer machine? So within about 10 minutes, I can say, go to house eight, because nobody picked up in there, no answer machines, so somebody's got to knock on the door, physically go there and see if maybe there's an elderly person, you know, just didn't hear it or something like that. So there is, uh, some compatibility issues in terms of the two systems that, I, that we've talked about, trying to get everybody on the same page. And not to just completely be, well, actually, I guess to completely beat it to death. Beat it to death. <laughs> I mean, beat it to death. You feel strongly about it, you came out beat it to death. It just seems to me that if you're going to evacuate the entire 
city of Danbury school system, yeah. public, private, and parochial, of 10,000 plus students, that that should get a similar priority. Oh, by the way, we're going to pick up your leads from your front yard. Yeah. And yeah. And I agree with that. her. I mean, this was one time. school that was a vacuum. I, I understand, but I can't, yeah. I can't carve out, I can't carve out people with school-aged children. That's the problem. If the so whole if city I, if I call, that, yeah, but the problem then is you end up creating a panic. You create a people that show up just to see what's going on. So you have to be very, we talked about that internally. Should we notify the whole city? And we really made a decision because the Honeywell system, the school board said, look, we've got this system. We'll call the parents and take care of that and it works and everything else. We made a decision to use, in a, you know, to use the system in a very targeted way. Because the danger is you can't, you know, people, when you have a problem, people will end up actually going out to see the problem. Instead of staying away, they get drawn to it. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't want to create an undue panic. Uh, that way as well. So I understand what you're saying, and I'm not suggesting that leaf pickup is not as important as, as your child. I, I know, I know. But we really, you know, we were really told by the DOE that they they had that issue covered of being able to contact with you. Um, by the way, and we and we have, from what I understand too, if you haven't keyed in your, your cell phone, um, do that. You can, I guess go online and do that. I should probably should probably email stuff. I don't know about it, but I think you should check the box. That's a building issue, and, and look, I always tell the principals, you've got a responsibility to secure your building, that's what we pay you for, and if, if he or she, where our building is, has a problem securing the building, they need to elevate that upwards through the, the Board of Ed to the superintendent, but I will pass that along. Okay. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I assume it is. I mean, if you're, tell, if you're telling me that, that there's nobody at the door when the child comes into the building, that's a problem. I know at the high school, because they used to work there, we used to have to wait with, you know, with 18 year olds, wait right out front. Mrs. Bacon has done a fabulous job yeah. changing that, and there's <coughs> one inside the building, one that's outside, right. but there's not a soul here, not even since that, this whole thing happened. Yeah. 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 Yeah
that we talked to Dr. Pasquarello about was, you got to give us somebody, even if it's not a school emergency, I want a Board of Ed uh, administrator here to liaison back and forth because some of these issues obviously touch us. Now, did that work good, or do you know that you'd do something different, like use the Danbury Pound building and split the city in half in, in a case like that by schools, or? I think, you know, um, you know you depending, yeah, depending on the level of evacuation, we did talk about uh, uh, splitting up and putting kids in a different spot. Uh, and our plan really says that we should leave kids in one spot. And the reason for that is that it gets too confusing for residents, particularly if you have streets closed and particular areas of the city closed. So you're in King Street, uh, you hear on the radio, it's PAL, you race over to PAL, but no, you can't, everybody on this side of the city got sent to the War Memorial. Now you're racing down the War Memorial. You can't get there because of the traffic. So that's why we chose, uh, and that's why we used the War Memorial for that. But we did have some things where we had people that were on field trips. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were, that came back late um, and that they sort of didn't know what to do. So they ended up coming to the War Memorial. And like I said, by about 4.15, everybody was pretty much gone. Um, and there was one student who got, went home with a friend. Kids do that. And then the mother called us. We found him. He was hanging out with his friend at his house. And another student um, who I think may have gotten on the wrong bus. And, you know, we got him to where he needed to be. But I have to tell you, the first student did a nice job. They, they, they really stepped up to the plate and they were right there. We had to get heart buses to go up to the high school to get the staff because it was, you know, very hot. We had, somebody had heart issues and they were, excuse the pun, but they were, you know, um, laid on the ground. So we had to get water for them and uh, keep them cool because they couldn't leave. They were stuck in a particular area. Um, so there were a lot of moving parts to the whole thing. We had, you know, we had to close the airspace down over the city mm -hmm. because we had, you know, Channel 8 helicopters whirring around over the head and everybody else getting, you know, this close into the students and into the staff members, so we close the airspace, and that takes a chain of command going up to the FAA, and I had to get on the phone with them in Boston and say, we want, you know, no fly zone, if you will, over Danbury. So, in general, I'm pleased about the way things work. It doesn't mean we can't improve in particular. Communication's key, we know that. And uh, I think some, some great points have been brought out here about knowing the evacuation plan for your child is a great idea. So you're in the loop. And um, I'm going to ask the superintendent to sort of mandate that to all the elementary schools so that everybody has that pre-opening meeting. And I think there's, there is a parent night that you come, right? But is that's that, actually an after is that school deep starts? Into the season? Yeah. We'll do something before school starts. I mean, and I'll, I'll talk to Dr. Pasquale. It's a great idea. Rob, your hands up or you stretch? Um, hands up. Okay. <clears throat> as far as the school budget goes, and this year is obviously going to be tough because there's, a, there's cuts involved, but you also have class sizes increasing. What's going to be done to keep the education level moving up? And I mean, we're going to have third graders, 26, 27, 28 kids to a class next year. There's no plan to bring a fifth teacher on. What is the plan with that? Well, um, we didn't cut the school budget. We gave them $5.3 million more dollars next year than they got this year. So it's not a cut, it's an increase. It's over a 5% increase, which is pretty generous considering what's going on in other communities. And so, uh, you know, one of the things we've got to do is we've got to work smarter. We've got to be able to uh, maximize our efficiency on the school side. We haven't done, we don't do that very well. And uh, the penalty that we pay is when those dollars are eaten at the top administrative level, they don't might migrate down to the teachers in the building who really need the money or the extra teacher that we need to reduce class size. Uh, but it, it's a difficult, difficult budget cycle this year, and it's going to be difficult next year as well. Um, in terms of enrollment, we, you know, the perception is that, well, you know, all the schools are overcrowded. That's not really true. We have some schools that are overcrowded, other schools that are underutilized. And so what we probably are going to have to do next year is a targeted redistricting. In other words, uh, I'll give you an example. Park Avenue is bursting at the seams. Mill Ridge Intermediate is about 50% full. So what we should do is take a couple of those neighborhoods that go to Park Avenue, and kind of flip them over and send them over to Millbridge Intermediate, spin those kids off, and now we're going to have schools that are better balanced. And we'll have room at Park Avenue, and we'll have room at Mill Ridge. Haystown is underutilized. Uh, Pembroke is full. Same, same kind of thing. So you're not necessarily redistributing the whole city because that's a disaster. Don't want to go there. Nobody's happy. People get upset that their child used to go to King Street, and now they're getting sent all the way down to, I don't know, make up another school. So we're going to try to target the redistricting to balance out the numbers. We already did that at Broadview, where we set up the STEM Academy at Rogers Park, and we had 300 applications for 110 seats in the STEM Academy. So how could we fit 110 more kids in Rogers Park? Well, because a lot of the kids that should go to Rogers Park don't, because they like to go to Broadview, so they sign up with their aunt or uncle and say that's their home address, because they want to go to Broadview, they don't want to go to Rogers Park. So by creating a new program there, 
now people are, want to go back to Rogers Park because there's going to be a, an outstanding program there. So that's another example of how to reduce class size without adding new teachers and costing money. So, and then you look at the big picture numbers wise, this year we had about 50 less kids in the high school than we did last year. So there's actually less kids over the perception that it's big. The reality is, is that each year we've seen numbers drop slightly. Um, we added the magnet school kids at our numbers, so you see like a 300 student bulge, but 240 of them are not that many. Probably 100 of them don't live in Danbury, they live in surrounding communities and come to the Danbury school. So in terms of numbers, we're, we're pretty static, but it's where the kids are that become a problem. It's even King Street. Kids want to go to King Street school, the parents want their kids to go to King Street school. If we try to send them to Pembroke, it'd be, you know, it, it, you know they'd be very upset. So uh, balancing the numbers in the building is important. Uh, managing the dollars that we give the board of bed is critical. They've got to frankly do a better job at doing that. They, 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 you know, my estimation that they've got more work to do. Is there a cap limit? I mean, gen gen is there a cap for, I mean, if you're talking 28 kids, yeah. can the teacher get full-time aid? Is there a number? Generally, generally speaking, and, and uh, our target goal is, depending on the group, high school's 25, um, you know, other, other going down from middle school to kindergarten and uh, elementary school is about 20, 22 would be maximum number. But I'll caution you, when you hear people have 26 kids, 27 kids, you really got to count who actually shows up and is in the door. And by the end of the year, and I know this because I used to teach, I'd have 28 kids on my roll, but you know, by May, I'd have 15. But do the city make adjustments? I'm a teacher also. No, they don't. So does That's someone right. call it by September 20th and go, every single elementary school has X, Y, and Z numbers? Well, maybe someone should. Rarely, they have done, I should say that, they have done that when we've had kindergarten classes where we've had 10 in one building and then we've had 20 in another. Um, they'll, they'll try to reprogram a teacher and move them over to another building, but they're very reluctant and hesitant to do that. Or, you know, they may have three classes of 10 in one building, they could collapse those and have two 15 classes and have and ship the other teacher to another building where, you know, there's a stress on the, uh, the building. Um, but the, it's very difficult to get them to think strategically that way. Actually, Dr. Glass does a nice job of that, but it's been a struggle to get people, you know, you see it and, and you experience it. We, we, we used to do that a lot in high school. But we were in the building, so it was easier. What about addressing the root issue, which is that we still, I've lived in Denver for 30 years. I went out of district for two years to go to Broadview when we lived in Rogers Park. I did exactly what people still to this day do. My younger brother, however, did not. What about coming down to the bottom line, which is addressing why it is that parents are so apt to want to be sending their kids to Broadview versus Rogers Park, and sort of addressing the issues that Rogers well, I, 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 I think there's a perception that there are issues at Rogers Park. And issues as well. Yes. Right, and, and the reality is, is that, you know, both schools are very well run. Uh, Ed Robson's a great school at Broadview. You can eat off the floors, it's that clean. Uh, and staff is motivated, they're hardworking. Uh, Principal uh, Joe Klim has, has turned around Rogers Park. They've just added this new the STEM program, um, which is, a, a, is a, an attempt to elevate the academics in the building, and people signed up. We got 100, we got 300 kids out of Broadview that wanted to be in that program. So you can tell, so that works. When you design programming that's successful, that works. Um, the other thing we have to look at, big picture wise, kind of go along both your questions, is we gotta look at the way we deliver educational services in general. Um, and we've just appointed a task force, um, Mayor's 2020 task force, to go out and re really redesign our schools, how we deliver educational services and instruction. A couple of things, you know, to, to keep in mind. We operate on an agrarian calendar, right? Our schools start in August, the end of June. Why do they do that? They do that because the kids need to go in the fields and harvest all summer. Well, we don't do that anymore. Nobody harvests anymore. Uh, we ought to start thinking about building buildings and using buildings that can be used year-round. We ought to start thinking about developing year-round calendars in Connecticut. It's crazy to spend $25 million on a building and you only use it eight months out of the year. It makes no sense economically. Um, you also have to look at using buildings uh, and breaking kids into smaller groups for targeted programming. Uh, so maybe we should have an academy of fine arts for the high school level. Maybe we should have an, a STEM academy that would be in science and math at the high school level. And they don't have to meet at the high school. They can, we can partner with Boeing or Engelheim, or we can partner with uh, the Westcon or Danbury Hospital or any of our corporate community partners to deliver instruction to make sure that they can participate in the high school experience, but also break kids into smaller groups. That's what, that's what all the research tells us works. So we've got to think differently about how we deliver educational services. That's going to be painful for 
um, not the community, but in general, statewide, um, you know, even, even the time of day, all the research will tell you that high school kids do not respond to being up at 6 a.m. and being in their first, my first class used to be at 7, 10 in the morning. And everybody was sleeping, because most of the kids had jobs at that point. They were tired. Um, and we know that elementary kids respond to being up early in the morning. You all probably know that, right? So why do we send our high school kids at 7 a.m.? We send our elementary kids at 9 a.m. Why? Because that's when the buses can run. And God forbid if the buses don't run appropriately, then the whole system crashes. So we got to start thinking about how we deliver these services and, and start thinking outside the box. Hopefully this committee will do that, because I really want to look at new and exciting programs. Who's going to make up this committee? Uh, we've got people from all walks of life. We've got business folks. We've got, uh, if you're interested, we always have room for people that want to get on. Uh, we probably could use an educator. We have people from the union on there as well. Um, and so we got to start thinking about how we do this, and, and city people as well. Um, I'm sorry, your hand's been up. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Going along with what we're talking about, and, you know, I know about the task force. Yep. And I know the five-year plan. Right. And we have to start thinking about, well, we have kids that are middle school, classes this year with 10 and 15 on the, on the road. Excuse me? I've been in kindergarten classes, at least three of them were there. Right. You don't have to remember they're half the day. Yeah. You know, they, <laughs> so you're technically talking. Well, they were all day classes. If they see this, they know, each school, they know how many kids are going to be coming into their schools. The dress it now, it's not as big as it was when I was in high school. You have to scramble around and say, oh, we need a new teacher, which happens here at King Street. And it sends everywhere. everybody back. Thank God we got the future. We were very happy. But we had to work hard to get what is justified. Instead of saying, okay, we're going to look at the enrollment. Enrollment is not decreasing. And, you know, as I said, we have middle school kids, kids in elementary schools now. I would say just keep at it now because we didn't. And we're in a situation where it is overpowered. I mean, I. I, I will tell you, again, look at the numbers. The numbers have not increased the way you think they've increased. It's where those kids are. It's those bulges of kids, whether they're five, six, seven, eight, or one, two, three, four, and there's large groups of, of, of kids across the board, and those grades, that becomes problematic because if you've got a small second grade, but you've got a huge fifth grade, you can't take a second grade teacher and move them. It's very hard to do that. Or they're in one building and move it to another building. So, Part of that is we're going to have to think differently about education. Part of it's driven by money, um, let's be honest, and that's difficult. Uh, you know, people, uh, particularly in these economic times, when you look across the, around, around us, every budget's going down. Uh, you know, Bethel has just been paid for play under sports. They're, you know, we're not Bethel, but I'm just saying, you know, you start hitting that wall where people are, are frankly going to say, look, I'm not willing to pay for that. Even if you have kids, I'm not. So the way to do that is to figure out a way to do things efficiently and cheaper, but deliver the same services. You know, we got contract negotiations coming up with the union next year. Okay, average increase, salary increase for teachers, five and a half percent each year. I mean, that's expensive. We got we got health care benefits that cost oh, us not. twenty. What's well, a step plus your salary? It is. It's a step plus your. I just settled our contract, and let me tell you, we did not get that. We went three years without one. Well, I don't, so, know, I mean, I don't know where you teach, I'm but I can tell you what. I know it. Yeah, but you know what? You only got to work 25 years, and you're out. Here you got 35 years, and you get Social Security. Actually. <laughs> you get Social Security here. You don't get to collect Social Security. Our health care plan is $22,000 per family. That's $22,000 to fund to fund our health care benefit. Uh, for uh, our teachers. It's, it, it's incredibly expensive. So somehow we've got to figure out a way to drive down costs, not compromise. I don't, I don't think teachers should, I think they should be paid. I'm not saying they should. But not compromise on that. 
Uh, and, but we have, you know, we're going to have to work together to do that. I mean, there's just no way we continue. Every year, our health our, our healthcare benefit goes up 13, 14 percent. Wow. So in 1999, we were spending about six million on benefits. This year is 15 million. Wow. Next year, it'll be probably 17 and a half, 18 million. So right off the bat, before I even look at what the taxes is, I got to find another three and a half to four million dollars just to fund the healthcare benefits for the existing teachers. Then you got to say, well, how much grandless growth, how much building do you have to generate to be able to fund that? The numbers get... Do they pay into their health at all? What's do that? the employees pay into they their pay health? They pay a premium co-share, sure. Who's your health care provider? Yeah, but they're paying for 10% 10 on the $22,000 policy. But I think it's 13%. Who's the health care provider? Uh, Anthem Blue Cross. No, Sigma. 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 It's a, yeah. Didn't you just change? Your hand was up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Button in. Sorry. Didn't the healthcare just company just change on the teachers halfway through the year this year? Last year they went from Anthem to Cigna, um, so instead of in a. And they had to switch doctors. Some of them had to switch who they used. Yeah. And right. Then. The way the contracts read it, it has to be equal to, uh, or better than the current level of service. So you can't just go from this plan to another plan. You have to you have to be able to present to the union you know, a similar plan. Now the Cigna plan is similar, and so instead of going up five million last year, we only went up three million or something like that. I mean, it's still kind of a big So you're getting Yes, I'll give you a softball here. Yeah. Really. <laughs> so uh, go back to the revenue side, yeah. and you talked about the costs and the efficiencies, yeah. and we talked about right. the budget. So, uh, and I, maybe I could even so saw, I've seen that my assessments have gone up in the group property sure. tax assessment, and understand the process, and probably, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the assessment. So, Heard people talk about the millages, maybe it's been adjusted yet. Right. But my question is, you know, with all the puts and takes, what's the uh, what's the up or down percentage across the area of the actual property tax here? Play. What's the percent percentage How of much is it our total increase in in this next cycle versus last year? For for residential, mm -hmm. the average home uh, about sixty percent of the homes uh, who had about between a thirty-five and say forty percent increase in their assessment. We'll see about a six and a half to seven percent increase in the taxes. Six and a half to seven from last year, over last year. Right. All right. So obviously, you talked at the beginning about you talked about the plan of the capital here. What you didn't say, and I think you probably want to say, was it is going to increase. It has to increase for all the things you talked about. Here, but, you know, well, I mean, when you look at the infrastructure of the schools, I mean, we just did analysis of. I mean, we got to replace just about every roof, every boiler, because for years. We deferred basic maintenance. That stuff catches up to you every time. And you know what? You try replacing a roof in the middle of November. I'm, you know, I don't know what to do for a living, sir, but you know, you got to rush the bid. You're going to get hammered because they know you got, you know, a school where there's people are getting wet, so they're going to charge you as much as they can. And so what happens is, is uh, um, because you defer that maintenance, you end up paying anything done in emergency is not a good way to do business. This year we started a new capital plan. We borrowed a, mar mo a modest amount of money, two and a half million dollars to start correcting that. So we're doing boilers here. We're replacing all the boilers in this building. We're doing a new roof at Park Avenue. New roof is $476,000 for one roof. The boilers here are probably 80 or 90 or 100,000 bucks. We're doing some work at Broadview because you, when you turn the water fountain on, you can't get water to come out. So we're putting new pumps in. That stuff adds up really fast. And not counting bridges, roads, drainage, um, all the other issues that you have. And so you gotta, you gotta make choices and prioritize What's the worst? The way we did it this year is we took the worst of the worst. Park Avenue, I was over there in the middle of, the, of November and there was water coming into the room. And we chased the leak there all winter long, patching it. That one would stay and then it would break somewhere else. Um, so that's the worst of the worst. The boilers here are in rough shape. We're gonna, they haven't been replaced in 25 years. And they're more efficient, so we'll save money on fuel, but we're gonna replace those. And so we're just gonna each year click through and do the things that need to get done because it costs you more to do it on an emergency basis. If these boilers go out, you can only imagine what it, would, what it would cost us to hire somebody on a weekend to come rush in, put a new boiler in, and you're going to pay double what you'd pay during the yeah, So I was unaware that we're doing all that. So is, that, is your plan you know, public or pretty transparent oh, yeah. to see you know, where we're oh, yeah. doing more investment? Yeah, we have a, a, it's a CIP, a capital improvement plan, okay. that um, g goes out uh, roughly five years on the stuff that has to be done. Uh, it's in the back of the budget book. Everything that's double star means it's a priority. Everything that's single star means you can probably wait a year or two to do that. The total pack CIP plan is $300 million. Okay, that's roofs, boilers, basic things, and we chose to do weather tight things first, like a roof and a boiler, because then you don't have mold issues, you don't have health issues with the staff. Um, once you let water come in, you end up getting mold and you get, you get sick building syndrome. But 
it's extensive. And these are, these are tough challenges. We're going to have to, you know, we're trying to be measured and nip at them once a year uh, so that we don't break the bank. But it's difficult. Thank it's difficult. You. Before you get too far away from what Barbara said yes, about sorry. class class sizes, I just want to go back to it about how it's done and and how the teachers just get slammed all over the place. We at King Street are losing all of our new teachers that we just got, and in this building we got one new teacher and we're losing him. Yet the school board knows that we're taking four second graders and they're shoving them into three third grade classes. And they're taking our new teacher and moving him to a third grade class at a different school, leaving these parents of the third graders to fight to get a new third grade teacher to bring it back to the four classes that it presently is. And he's moving to a school that you had just mentioned, sorry to interrupt, that is, that is half full, Hayestown, and you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's a little bit more and half full, but it's, it, third, it's underutilized. And, and third he's grade. teaching third grade. So we're losing a teacher that we just got yeah. that's familiar with the school. They're dumping him off to another school when they know that they're going to have overcrowded third grade classes this year but they're leaving it up to see how hard the parents are gonna push and scream and yell to get another third grade class. And if they're successful enough, if the squeaky wheel squeaks enough, and they get a third grade class, it's not gonna be his. They get another new teacher yeah. to have to come and join and this also building. And that's just not, I don't think it's fair how they switch the teachers around. There's no familiar, familiarity. And when teachers work hard to get to this building, because King Street obvious is the creme de la creme place to work as far as teachers Good, are concerned, great, great school. it's not fair yeah. to take teachers out of this building when they know darn well they're going to need them and put the onus and the responsibility onto the parents to fight to get teachers back. Uh, and if they don't fight loud enough, well then the class stay 26, 27 kids, and if they do fight loud enough, then you get some first year teacher in here to teach the kids. I, I just don't think it's fair. The only I can tell you is uh, we appropriate money to the Board of Ed. They make these strategic decisions. If I could make the decision, I'd give you a third, third grade class tomorrow. But I, I don't get to make that. I can certainly socialize this over there, and I'll talk to them about it after tonight. Um, and again, the number is 5.3. That's 5.3 million more dollars next year than they got this year. I like to know where it all goes. Well, who watches, somebody can tell me who watches how please. they spend it then? The Board of Ed does. That's why they're elected separately and by state statute. We don't have the authority. I can't, I, knowing what I know about the school district, I would love to have a line item deal, right? I'd love to be able to take their budget and go, not doing that, yep, we need that, that's important, yep. I know what he does, he's better find something else to do, and, and I, I, I can manage the budget. But I don't have that luxury. I cannot direct them to spend it on certain things. I can only give them a lump sum. Are you in charge of him? No. He Who's in the, charge of him? The Board of Ed. Oh, yeah, yeah. So in other words, you have nothing to say to him? I don't hire him, and I don't fire him. I mean, I can ask, and I will. I'm going to mention it to them, along with some of these other things that's brought up. If a parent has a voice and you get nothing, and you go to the administration, and then you go to the Board of Ed and you get nothing, then are you done? I mean, because there's, there's a I big problem. Board, yeah, there's I, a big problem at the school, yeah. communication-wise, involvement, and everything. And it's glaring. If you look at KSP, KSI, it's glaring right now. Yeah. Parents, well, I, I, parents I are shut out here, though. Where do we where do we go? Because you obviously have a voice. Right. Where do we go to get that answer? Because we get shut out at the board of ed, we get shut out here. Then we're just left hanging. Well, I, what I can I can't order them to do anything. I can take your concerns and bring them over there, which I'll do. You know, I've, I've heard loud and clear about some issues tonight, and I'll talk to Dr. Be Dr. Besserell about that. But ultimately, he reports to the board of ed. You elect the board of ed. If you don't elect the board of ed, vote them out and tell them why you're voting them out because they won't work with the mayor and some wisdom. Don't say that. But, <laughs> but you gotta, you got to talk to them and, and let them know that you're engaged and you're watching. Look, we have a PTO that, you know, sometimes I think we can do better. We should have more engaged parents in the PTO process. We're not as active as we should be um, because when I'm up putting a big number on the school budget, when I'm asking for money from the council, I need you to come to the council meeting and say, this is a good idea and let me tell you why. Because I'm going to tell you something. This year was a battle. And all due respect to our council folks, there, there were some folks, not the guys, ladies and gentlemen here, two more have joined us, there were, there were people on that council that wanted to cut the school budget down to nothing. And I had to fight to keep it where it was. Um, they and don't have children in this 
but you've got to rally every third grade parent right. and get them down there to the Board of Ed meeting and you keep going until right. they keep listen going. to you. And you and tell them. And you harass them. Well, and right. they do need to go because right. I'll tell you this. In a nice way. <laughs> In a nice way. In a nice way. Right. You have to know you this advocate. PTO fought you had all year long with all the su superintendents, assistant superintendents, and we got absolutely no place. Uh -huh. So don't rely on the PTO to do it. You need to do it yeah, because yeah. we got slapped in the face every time we turned around. How many people at the PTO meetings, how many people typically come out? 10, yeah. 11, because okay. they think that we're Superman and we can do it ourselves, and we can't. In a system of 10,000 students, we get 10 parents to come to a PTO meeting. We, we've got to do a better job. Because yeah. nothing gets done, we've right? Gotta, and nothing changes. It, it never does. Great. They don't listen to us, they don't listen to the PTO. I listen to you guys. I'll take it. But you're not their boss. I know. I know. Uh, who wants to I run know. for some from there? For the money. Because by statute, we change. have to appropriate. They write their own budget. They present it to me. I'm and I'm run it. I think for you. this I'm year they asked for about. Let me just tell you what, what how the process worked. I know you got to handle it, but um, this year they asked for. I think it was a seven seven point three percent increase, which is about eight and a half million more dollars than they got last year. Okay, that's just like, there's no way I can do it. Just think about what it takes to raise $8 million over what we did. That's two mils in your taxes, if not more. Not counting all the other expenses we have. So, um, in the process of talking to them, when I look closer, not only do they want the $8 million more million, they also wanted $3 million more for technology. High school computers are, from the, my, my computer's still at the high school, I swear to God. I left in 2001. It's still there, right? So it's eight years old that I know of, and it was like four years old when it was there. So the computers haven't been replaced since 1996. The switches were falling off the walls. Those are, uh, the servers were collapsing. They didn't know if they could report cards out for the fourth quarter. They, they have them ready, but they didn't know. Um, so that really was an $11 million request. It wasn't an $8 million. We got it down to about 5355 five, five by working closely and saying, look, you've got to prioritize what you really need. I went and funded the computers through a bond issuance, and uh, the technology piece through a bond issuance. Um, but still, uh, you know, you, we can't sustain that kind of spending. It's impossible. No, nobody can do it. And it's, but on the other hand, if you've got targeted issues, like a third grade teacher, you can make a difference. You, you, I'm telling you, you pick up the phone and call those school board members. Tell them that you, you, know, you get a petition out, bring it in there, tell them you want it done. They, they just need to feel, you know, the love. <laughs> but, but let them know. Let them know that you're watching and you're concerned. Okay, Jean, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I have to take this completely off the top Feel of the minute because I have go to ahead. go. Um, what, what brought me here tonight is that I really feel like um, in Danbury there's been a major crescendo in the racism. And I know I sound like a broken record, um, but about a year ago, um, two local access talk show hosts um, were cited as basically saying the firebomb should be, I mean, the Hispanic Center should be firebombed, that the um, immigrants' rights supporters should be shot by snipers if they march down Main Street. And then you see all the comments on the news times. Don't read those comments. <laughs> you know, you know, but, um, and then what really brought it to more of a personal level this week, a friend of mine who's um, a legal um, permanent resident here in the United, the United States, has been here 25 years. He's an elderly man who is looked to many as an elder, a teacher, and a, a civil rights supporter, was using the um, computers at the public library, which he does all the time. He um, had a disc sitting next to the computer. He had to go up and get up and use the restroom. He came back to his computer. The disc was gone, and there was a message on the computer that was extremely disturbing. Somebody had obviously been watching him, saw him get up and left a message on the computer for him. And um, most of it was rambling. I just want to um, kind of read the most disturbing part of it. He said, uh, the Panama Canal was sold, so we might sell back Spain under Juan Carlos, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Cuba, and perhaps the Philippines. Free tickets home to your country are provided by Lufthansa Airlines. Seek your assistance at the reservation desk, or wait to see if someone like General Pershing, Patton, and MacArthur would do what they did back then, just round you all up and march you back to your native countries. Why should we pay the expense of airfare? You are simply too much of an expense. Maybe we should put you, well, maybe we should do what the Germans did to the Jews and put you all in a big cell and just exterminate you. This was left on his computer at the public library. 
Now, this is somebody who I love very dearly. He's a wonderful man. And the thought of him sitting at this library, coming back and seeing that message, and then having to turn around and look and say, who hates me this much? Who is doing this? Who left this message for me? And not feel safe in a public municipal building because he doesn't happen to have white skin is extremely disturbing. And so my question to you there is you are the mayor of the city. You are supposed to be setting the tone in the city. You are supposed to be showing leadership in this town. I know that you cannot control what people say. You cannot control what people think. But you can set an example. And I want to know right now, what are you doing to kind of combat this kind of environment in Danbury? What are you doing to try to address this tension in this city and try to get people to think in a halfway human tone. Well, let me just say that that's just a horrible situation that that gentleman had to go through. And um, it's ironic, because I just had a discussion with our library director tonight about some of the people that have been hanging out in the library, because uh, we had an event down there before I came here. But um, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, it's too bad we couldn't you know, track down who did that. We could ban them and all that other stuff on a, on a, on a personal level. But you know, on the big picture level, uh, people, you know, that are passionate about an issue uh, on either side have got to um, tone it down, for lack of a better term. And, and here's the problem. The problem is, is that there's nothing racist with being concerned about the issue of illegal immigration. There's nothing racist about that. That's right. But, let me just finish. But the problem is, when you try to have a, a discussion that's up here, is that there are 20% of the people that will use that as a segue, they'll use it as a wedge to who are racist to, to start spouting raceful, hurtful things. I'm not saying that's a direct result of this, I'm just saying you see it on the News Times boards and, and all of that other stuff. On the same token, there are people on the other side that throw around the term racist all the time. They call people racist, they don't even know them. Um, and I, so I think you when know, I say we have to tone it down a little bit, I think there has to be a recognition by people on the far left that say, okay, uh, there are there are 67 percent or 60 percent of people or whatever many people there are legitimate people that are concerned about this issue and think that it's a disaster immigration policy disaster we respect you we agree to disagree with you but we respect you there are 20 percent of the racist people out there and they're disgusting that person's disgusting that did that and they cannot participate in the conversation you can't give them any power you can't listen to them i mean you can't stop them from talking they're going to talk but they can't you know they, they, they can't um, you know, let them dominate the conversation, just like you can't let the other people that run around and point the racist finger away. There's nothing more horrifying for me to have somebody call me a racist. It's horrible. It's horrible. You know, that sticks with you forever. Unfair. I'm going to leave being mayor sometime. I'm going to go back to high school. I don't want kids Googling my name and saying, oh, oh, mayor, you're a racist. That's awful. You know, that's just as stigmatizing, even to our council people, who are business men and women and business leaders. They don't want to be called racist either. May let me I just interrupt finish. you for so, a minute? So, I'm going to just finish. So, so, that has to be addressed. And on the other side, there are racist people. There are, they're out there, and they're disgusting. And you know, when, they're, when they do something racist and disgusting, they need to be called on. And uh, uh, together, you know, we can accomplish a lot more of that in terms of dialogue than we can by constantly going back and forth about that. I, look, Gene, you and I don't agree on this issue, but I respect you. You know that. I taught you at school. You're brilliant. But I respect that. I respect your opinion, and I, and, and, and I, I let you always speak. And, I, and I, you know, you really do shed light on some things. Uh, when, you're, when you're discussing things. Um, and, and sometimes we agree just to disagree, but that doesn't mean that I don't respect you. But we have to teach other people to have that same attitude because the dialogue is frustrating. Um, and there are racist people. There's no question. But may I, may I interrupt to say that it, what you just said seemed like you were saying this is what you can do, okay? Like no, you're no, putting no, no, the no. onus on the other people. Right. What I'm saying, I'm asking you, what are you doing in a leadership role to bridge the gaps to create dialogue and to kind of um, stand up. And I mean, I know the history of Danbury. I know your father marched in the, mm -hmm. the uh, parades when they had to do with the, the race riots. You know, he marched in the um, march to defend racial unity. So I know the history of Danbury. I know your father was deeply involved in that. What are you doing to bridge that gap now in Danbury when we're seeing? Because obviously, this man's a legal permanent resident. He's been here 25 years, and there are many people in Danbury that have perfect status and they're feeling the effects of the racism in, in, that's flared up. What are you doing in your leadership role to calm that down? That's the question. Well, let me, let me just say that. What does the city do already? I mean, when you look at the library, for example, the programming that we offer in the library, library 
A lot of that is geared specifically towards folks that have just gotten here from other countries. We teach ESL at the library. We spend tens upon tens of thousands of dollars developing program to, to capture everybody in that, not just people only speak English, but the entire community. Um, so any programs that, that are developed around that um, are good programs, and they're driven by my office. I just left a reading program. The reading program didn't say it was only for these kind of kids. It was for anybody that wanted to participate. That's how you pull the community together. You don't pull the community together by uh, being divisive on either side. And, uh, and again, I, I just want to emphasize, when somebody uses that kind of language, when they do that kind of action, maybe not in that forum, but in even a public forum, they need to be called out and said, you can't do that, that you're wrong, you need to apologize. You can't participate uh, in the things that we're doing. Just like when people throw around the term racist all the time, and I'm not saying you do that. I'm just saying in general, that can be equally as, as hurtful and offensive to people. So for my office, the best thing we can do is drive programs that bring people together, that don't separate people. And I'll certainly listen to suggestions that people have, uh, even beyond the things that we're doing. I don't have the market corner on good ideas. If, if you have one or anybody else does, shoot me an email and, and we'd love to participate. Well, the more we can bring together people to bet, together, the better because it breaks down barriers. There is one time that I went to a common council member uh, meeting and a, count, and a uh, member of the community got up to the microphone and said something very similar to what was said here. Maybe not quite as harsh, but very close to even referenced, I believe, at that time, the um, internment camps um, uh, of Japanese. And there was no strong response from your leadership role. You kind of sat there and, you know, kind of said, oh, hey, you know, but not really, there wasn't a strong response. Now, I don't know what your duty as mayor and, and as chair of a common council meeting is, but in those situations, it would mean a lot to people in our community if you would stand up and make a strong statement, if you would write an op-ed piece, if you would do something to say this stuff is volatile and inappropriate, and it's not, it's, 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 not it's toxic. Look, it's toxic, there's no question about that. And, you know, let me just say, I don't know what incident you're, you're, you're sort of speaking to. Generally, uh, we do give people latitude when they give their comments. Um, but certainly, uh, it's not an endorsement of any comment of what anybody says up there. I mean, people say some wild stuff, not even about this issue. You go to the meetings, you, you know, you kind of probably sit there and think, well, you know, so it is a problem. Yeah, your hands up. I just wanted to say, um, I'm, I'm a daughter of immigrants from Italy, and I know exactly how you feel, okay? But I have to tell you, since I moved to Danbury, I've never seen, a, I've never lived in a place better in my life where there's been community, okay? I live in the South Bronx, okay? I come from the South, I'm a Bronx girl, okay? And living here has been the best thing for my family and my, and my entire family. I have to tell you that. That's one isolated incident. We've gone through it when we're where we lived. But if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, it's actually very small. The power is within you. Don't let anybody ever let you feel like you're, like you're nothing. And I also want to say I'm very proud to be a parent of King Street Primary. My daughter did phenomenal this year. I'm one of those people that was on the fence, parochial, pri uh, parochial public. You made the right choice. I made the right choice. I have to go. <laughs> but thanks, Mayor. You're doing a phenomenal job. And thanks for fixing those uh, potholes on West King. <laughs> Have a great summer. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I just have a comment about what you said. You said, oh, Jean, don't pay attention to those letters um, at the News Times or on the New Times. Uh, the thing is, I do pay attention because I try to keep informed. I read not only the News Times, but I speak three languages. I read the Brazilian paper and the Hispanic papers because I feel like I have to be informed. And if you notice, I'm sure you read it also, as part of I, the I really try not to, I swear. I really the same do. people, the same people, and I will say racist people, because by the letters they write, it's always the same people. And what disappoints me, I am of a Brazilian background, because, and I go a lot to the Common Council meeting, those people are always there, and they always step up to talk, and we all know, we know who they are. And I feel like they are very welcome there, and I think they are, uh, my husband is American and we lived in Brazil for many years and we worked at the American school. There was always a small group of Americans that were not happy with anything. And the good Americans called them the ugly Americans and I never understood why they're calling them the ugly Americans. They actually look good. Now I know what they mean and those ladies are the ugly Americans. And they're there and that really bothers me. 
Okay, but that's the kind of inflammatory language that we got to stop, Rosalie. You can't call people ugly, all right? Because that just drives the debate down, and then they start calling the names back. And then I explained to you. We have to elevate they, they ourselves. They use the term ugly to just say people fish. who are not happy, who upsets other people. Right. You know, it's well, not well, a, listen, ugly. There are. Let's let's go back to the original comment. Mm -hmm. There are 20 percent out there, uh, 20 percent people out there that are racist, that are miserable, that blame the world for whatever the problem is. They, they exist, but there are also people. And they may not be the, they're not the same people that are legitimately concerned with about an issue that's run away from this country. I mean, we, we don't have a coherent immigration policy. And we should be able to talk about the issue as uh, reasonable adults who will agree on some things and disagree on other things. And, and, and shake hands and say, all right, I disagree with you, but we have to move on. We, we've separated from that, and, that, and that, that's a problem. Now, some of those folks, wherever they may be, you may never get them to the table to be an adult. person who writes an email like that, you, you, they're not listening. You're never going to reach them. And you can't change that. But you can change the, 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 the discussion amongst the 67% of people at both sides of the issue that are rational and that you know want to at least have a discussion. So how we do that isn't just going to be driven by me. It's got to be driven by everybody. And I understand, but you are the head of the city. And sure. if you say, look, everybody, whoever you are, this is not acceptable. And I've done that. Um, I've even talked to the. I've even talked to the. I've even talked. I've even talked to the news times. I've even talked to the news times about the comments on their comment section that they're completely racist and inappropriate, and you shouldn't leave them there. I think they're totally wrong. I've talked to the editor. I've talked to the publisher, and said you need. To, in fact, the current just had a big thing today about um, about how they whether why they don't read these comments and how, why they don't delete them and you know I don't want to get to the technicalities and why they don't do that the point is I'm as deeply offended as you are okay you know I need it both sides you know if my name is mentioned I've got 30 comments in there that say racist 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 how do you think that makes me feel I mean that hurts yeah then could you come out publicly like I said with an op-ed a letter to the editor a comment somewhere not just says that not just says what you just said like the well there's 20 percent on either side that are irrational but there's you know reasonable people in the middle not just that because you said that a hundred times right. how about saying something forceful that says this absolute racism is horrible and cannot be tolerated in this city we're not going to take it as a city anymore this is not the climate i want to create here thank you Okay, I've got three things. Very quick. All right. I have uh, a message from a teacher, a gym teacher at Broadview, who okay. couldn't make it today. Teacher of physical education. Well, when is Broadview getting a new auditorium? I'm not even a Broadview parent. I just did a new auditorium at Broadview. We spent $10 million bucks up there. Well, they said that the, 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 gymna sorry, the gymnasium floor. We got a new floor coming. Uh, they do. Yeah. And that they, you know, they've had 40 students per teacher for some gym classes this year. So that was her complaint. She wasn't very happy. I have to say, uh, my second thing is that I went to Rogers Park orientation this year. Last time was four years ago. I have to say I was very impressed. So there's a good one for you. I, I thought that the school and uh, Mrs. Joaquin has turned the school around. I know they've had a lot of renovations. So I'm really actually pleased. And I think that Rogers Park is just as good as Broadview. And um, if not better now with the STEM program. And then. My third one is we keep talking, these guys are talking about you know the overcrowding of classrooms at King Street. I also have a third grader here who's going to fourth grade, and they are apparently going to lose a class as well. And I was one of the parents with Barb here who was petitioning out here on the first day of school last year, and I'm prepared to do it again. And it took five days for them to get us another teacher. Uh, last year, and you know, I don't want to go through that again. That's what we go back to. Let's keep Mr. Hammond here. I know he's going to have a position here at some point, whether it's going to be with third grade, fourth grade. We do not need to leave the teachers here. And I, I will, I will bring that over to the board. Yeah, there's, there's going to be a position somewhere, and that's it. Thank you. I'm not going to talk about school anymore. I'm switching gears. I got a whole new subject. Just, Police department. Yes. You're, you have a very high number of police department, of police officers in the police department that are very poorly, poorly, poorly trained in domestic violence and domestic abuse. They're also a little sexist. 
And I think that you need to do something about cross-training the police department and have them work even maybe one week training either in the Women's Center or in the courthouse with the um, representatives for domestic violence. They are very misinformed in the field with the information that they hand out, with the way that victims are treated, uh, with the way reports are written up, and women pay a very high price on the other end. And there are a very high number of police officers that just really don't care about it. Um, police officers make a lot of money. They are the one person that stands between a very bad situation when they arrive upon it. And quite frankly, a lot of times they cause more trouble when they get there than that has already gone on. And something needs to be done about the police department in, in regards to how they respond to domestic violence and how very, very misinformed they are regarding it. I will uh, bring that to the chief, and that's something I can do something about. Um, I'll, uh, you know, let me dig a little deeper into this, find a little more about this. I will tell you um, that in my tenure, uh, we've hired more women police officers than ever in the history of the city. We have a lot of female officers out there, I don't know if you spotted them. In this pool of new officers um, that we're getting ready to certify, uh, there are a lot of females as well. Uh, we've also ordered up training, which touches us a little bit, uh, for the fall, for every single department, every single employee, sensitivity training, we're bringing a consultant that's going to start with the police department. She's wonderful. She does rides along, particularly for the sexism side. She does ride alongs with the cops. She really gets engaged with them and does a whole program designed to try to, 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 to elevate a little bit of their uh, delivery services. I guess is what I'm going to say. Um, not trying to beat anybody down, tell them they're wrong, we're trying to get them better training and so to recognize the things they need to train. So part of what she does is that. We also have a victim's advocate as well that works in the, in the police department that specifically does And the victim's advocate is the person who said they are very, very, very highly in need of cross-training in, well, that, in that department. We'll, we'll certainly, you know, again, I'm going to talk to the chief and the deputy chief, and that's certainly something that's doable, no question about that. So, absolutely. That's good points. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what else? What else we got here? Anybody need a background? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, one more Greg Seaberry, uh, Fred Visconti, both council people with us, as well as Louise McMahon, who's a first ward council person as well, so they've joined us also. I just wanted to ask yes, sir. a question. Yeah. Being we're talking about money all the time, this Hispanic Center being funded. <coughs> now, we're there. in the ICE program now, right? We uh, have been uh, endorsed uh, by the Boston Office for participation in the program. Uh, our application is currently in Washington, D.C. Uh, that takes a couple of month turnaround, uh, but we expect to be accepted to the program, yes. All right, now, the conflict of interest here. This uh, Hispanic Center, does it support or help illegal immigrants? Uh, the Hispanic Center, you know, helps anybody that comes to the door that needs training, that needs um, uh, <coughs> services that they offer. So you can't really say that they're only serving folks that are here uh, illegally, um, they are, uh, uh, they provide a myriad of different services. Um, we uh, reserve the right, I think I speak for the council, to go back and look at that issue again um, in terms of their funding. Uh, but we, you know, one of the problems that we have is that, big picture now, we give out $1.3 million to nonprofits and we do it with really no accountability. We don't know where the money's going. We haven't identified what services we need, what we don't need. So we're gonna rework the whole grant agency process. We're gonna create silos of services. So we'll need job training. We might need language skills, teaching people English. That might be one thing. Women's Center and the services they provide will be another one. Youth services, what they provide. And then we're gonna fund those things at a greater level, but not fund every nonprofit in the entire city because when people get little $5,000 grants or $10,000 grants, you're not really impacting a particular core group of people by doing that. You're not, you're not helping the bigger problems that you want to help. So we really need to identify what our needs are and then fund them uh, and try to make our dollars count a little bit more. So the Women's Center, instead of getting $80,000, maybe we would be giving them $160,000 so that they can use that money for training for peace officers throughout the region because they deal not just in Amory but through the region. Um, and so we want to make sure that those dollars have the biggest impact. The Hispanic Center will play in that, I'm sure will play in that discussion, because they provide needed services. Um, you know, we fund literacy volunteers who teach us English. We fund the library. We probably spend 50 grand in the library teaching English. 
Maybe we ought to just give the money to one organization, let them do all the English skills and all that stuff and, and fund just one group and kind of pull back a little bit in other organizations. So we got to look at how we, we fund them. But the Hispanic Center, I'm going to tell you, does do uh, some positive things for the community. The director, I've been very impressed with the new director. Um, she uh, uh, has sort of refocused and redirected. Um, but uh, we still have some work to do in terms of... That's our taxpayers' money, right? It is, yes, sir. They, their budget's about uh, three, 300000 400000 That's not city money. You know, we, I think we, our discussion was about 25000 bucks. But, yes. But what percentage, what percentage do you estimate um, the Hispanic population is in Denver? Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, I can say it's a moving target. It's difficult to calculate only because there is a lot of mobility. But if you looked at the latest report, we're about 67% white, non-Hispanic, about 20, 25% uh, Latino, and then 6% um, African American. And we have actually a large uh, Asian population, but keep in mind, Asian, they categorize uh, Indian and Pakistani folks as well. So um, I think we're about 12% or so. Then that's just how the Census Bureau does it. So, not so a quarter of the population is, is Latino or Hispanic. I so think that's fair. apparently they're doing a considerable amount of work amongst the population. They do, um, you know. Uh, look, my father started funding the Hispanic Center 25 years ago, so um, you know they they got off track on their mission probably two or three years ago, and once that happened, um, it became problematic for uh, for the council. And I didn't fund them this year because we never restored the funding last year, um, and so you know in the budget process, the council you know made a decision. Uh, that they didn't want to fund them coming up uh, because we're, we're looking at you know, retooling this whole process because there's no accountability. We're giving people money. We don't know what services they are providing, and uh, we want to really target our dollars, particularly as the economy is shrinking, to providing the services that we need. So it's a challenge. Yes, the Hispanic Center, like many other nonprofits, also receives private donations. Yes, they do. To provide other services that the and state don't fund, right? And state money as well. And state money. State money. Yeah. Oh, sure. So that will be an ongoing discussion. Okay? Um, real quick, uh, I want to talk about the bonding. Al, am I going to make like, your greatest hits? Real quick, real fast. Be nice. Um, I'm always nice. Come on. <laughs> um, this year you, you bonded, uh, we had five bonds that came out to be $2.5 million, which is 500, you broke it into $500,000 Correct. piece. Um, one of those bonds was for the new computer equipment at the school. At Cambry High School, correct. One of them. Um, as opposed to previous years where, you know, bonds of, let's say, $2.5 million would have went to a referendum which would have had a, a say on yes or no, um, could we have, was there some reason why these bonds were presented the way they were in terms of like $500,000 pieces instead of, let's say, um, two $1 million bonds and one $500,000 bond that could have been voted on by the council? Yeah. Um, the reason was is that our charter says that anything over $500,000 has to go to the voters. Right. So you can't, uh, any, you have to have a single project or two projects that aren't connected. So for example, on the roof one, it's the easiest one. You have the roof of Park Avenue and you have the water pumps in Broadview. Total amount adds up to $500,000. Two separate projects that don't exceed the $500,000 cap. That you can do. Um, you couldn't lump everything together in one million. I mean, you could, but then you'd have to go to referendum. Right. Well, referendum cost about $35,000 to run, and by the time we did a referendum, it would have been the fall. So we wouldn't have, had, for example, computers at Danbury High School. So, the next, so we could have put it on the November ballot, but by the time we actually vote on it, go out to bid on it, and do the computers, students would have high school to the middle of the year. You probably wouldn't get report cards. And same thing for the roof at Park Avenue. You'd have a leaky roof. Um, and I have to tell you, I think that uh, you know, our council people, um, as part participating in representative democracy, uh, they shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to put a roof replacement up for a vote. I mean, I think we should constantly be looking at our infrastructure and changing it over and changing it over. Bigger projects, like a police station, like a new school, like a parking garage, that should go to the, should go to the voters uh, because it's, it's big in scope and there has to be a community decision about, about doing that. Um, in this case, um, and, and I'll just tell you, give you some background on, on why we did it this way. In the charter revision process, if you're following that, you notice I recommended that we spend 2.5 million. We were always under the assumption that there was an annual cap of 500,000. 
When we went to our bank counsel, who's been our bank counsel, our lawyer for 35 years, 30 years on this, my father appointed him in 1978, um, he said, and Rick Gottschalk, who had been our corporation counsel for years, said, oh, no, no, there's no annual cap. It's per project. And I said, well, why didn't anybody ever do it that way? Why do we run referendums for even the smallest projects? And uh, the response to me was, well, you know, the city had a policy of just doing 500000 a year. So for us, this was a matter of policy. It wasn't a matter of whether you could do it or not. In fact, uh, the bond council said, you certainly can if you wanted to. And that's how we uh, opted to do it this year. I would sort of challenge people and say, look, of those projects in there, which one would you call? I mean, you got to do a phosphorus study. You know that. The DEP's going to order us. we got the order in hand. Uh, we need computers at the high school. Um, uh, we need uh, police equipment and firefighting equipment. We need a roof. Um, so it wasn't like we were out spending money on, on sort of frivolous things. I mean, these are the nuts and bolts infrastructure that we need to manage the city. Um, it's new. It's different. I understand that. Some people didn't agree with it. I respect that. Um, I think even uh, uh, the council, all of the council, uh, voted to fund more than $500,000, um, and two of the votes were unanimous. Um, so I think people generally sort of didn't like it, but agreed that, yeah, you, you can do that. Um, it's different. Look, there's no question about that. Well, one more follow-up. I, I know with the computer equipment, because I was watching that a little bit, with the computer equipment for school, it seems like that's one, one part of a phase of, of a master plan. It is, yeah. Let's just say, why couldn't they just give you the entire plan, give you the price tag for it, send it up for referendum? I can't remember the last time anything that went up for referendum that passed. Give us the whole bill, send it to the voters, let's vote on it, let's just get the equipment updated, and let's not do the space stuff. Just give, give us the entire bill, give it to the referendum, let the people decide, and let's yeah. vote on it. Well, we, you know, you could do that, but again, uh, the earliest you'd have a referendum would be November. And well, you, you, uh, unless, unless you set up a special town meeting, a special referendum in January or July or, or, or May or whatever you We had a referendum for the primary. Yeah, but you, you need 60 days to notice it. So, you oh, know, man. right, you have, you have to fit in a timeline. But yeah, you could do, you could do it before yeah. November, but you're going to spend 35000 bucks running a voting uh, thing. Uh, and if it goes down, then what do you do? Then you got kids that don't have computers, and I don't think really that's a decision. I think it's a decision that government ought to be providing computers to kids. And I think we need to do that. Um, and when you look around what's going on in the rest of the communities, whether it's Bethel or Brookfield, I mean, they're, you know, they're just, people are just voting no because they're so frustrated with the economy. And that's going to have deep impact on, on those school districts. And uh, again, I think these are infrastructure nuts and bolts things that the government ought to be doing. And the council is perfectly capable of making a decision whether or not they should fund it or not. And people aren't happy with the decision the council made or I made. We'll vote for us a year from now. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns? Well, I appreciate you coming out. Let me just say to the King Street folks, I, I heard you. I'm going to take this back, and we will definitely have a meeting before the beginning of September to go over these evacuation plans. I think the superintendent ought to, ought to go to all elementary schools, and, and we'll try to bring in the parochial schools as well. I think it's a great idea, uh, and we'll work on I don't have a Honeywell update for you tonight, but I'll find out where they are and making sure that that system is going to work the right way. You know, one of the things I said to the superintendent, I'm trying to beat this to death, because we know we did. But I said, look, if people hadn't entered into the, their cell phone numbers into the system, are we taking proactive steps to, to get them to do that? Because if you just have the home number, you're working during the day. You're not, you're not going to get that call. Um, and so that's one of the things that they're going to have to do some outreach this, this year. And you can get uh, text messages as well as emails, too, with the system is all that. So, I'm going to take that stuff back. I'll try for the third grade teacher or fourth grade teacher. I'll do the best I can. Would a petition help? Yes. Like if we absolutely got well, a petition to keep him here and the second graders. Why do you guys say no? They did it already. To Rawls, they got well, who did they get the petition to? To the board of ed. Yeah. They gave it to the got board of ed. nowhere. They lost two great teachers. It is like they talking really to a wall. Teachers. With the board to the of same school. Well, one great, of them that's a great teacher. We want him. And he's a male teacher. And that's well, he is helping kids now. somewhere else in the <laughs> district. Well, he wants <laughs> to stay I, here. I know. I know. I'll, uh, I'll tell you what. We're losing all our male teachers. Yeah, yeah, male teachers, teachers are a hot teacher. monitor. We need I gotta come back to teachers. Yeah. I don't even have Mr. Hammer, and I don't even know if my job will ever have it. I feel it's important for him to stay here. I'll, 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 I will, I, I can't promise, I, 
I, I have about as much pull as you guys do on this, but I'll at least raise the issue. You're in trouble if you have as much pull as we do. Thank You're you. the mayor. And yeah, we have it doesn't work that way in Connecticut. The superintendent runs the show. So what, what should we do? Probably response back on why not is, do you respond back? No, I well, don't want to I will. If you guys, you can email me and I'll email you. Give me a couple days to work. When's the next I got nothing. Uh, well, they're meeting right, I think they're meeting tonight, but I'm. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, let's go right now. Come on, let's go. <laughs> well, can I ask you a quick question? Is the STEM Academy in fact happening? Because there's a lot of yeah. things. Yeah. And I was just told by an employee of Broadview that they didn't get enough kids signed up from Broadview. That they no, got, no, no. The bulk of, that's not accurate. That the majority of the kids that signed up were not part and it may not be happening. Oh, I'm hearing see. that at the same time as anything. No, it's, I mean, I, I talked to Dr. Pascal as two days ago and he said it's happening. So, I mean, he didn't say, hey, we're not going to do it. We didn't get enough kids to bite from Broadway. Well, the, the uh, deadline was a couple days ago, so now I'm wondering if it's Friday. Friday late afternoon, somebody in Broadway was like, child hasn't been signed up. They're not going to sign up. Okay, it's happening. But what they honestly could do is just have to have days. It's happening. Last I heard it was happening. I'll check on that too. I'll check on it. Yeah, but you have no pull with the school board. I have no draft. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I'll be here. Yeah, I'll be Yes, you did. I lost my job that year. <laughs>